And now, stand up community subscribers and listeners from around the globe, it's time to stand up with Pete Dominic, where we ask the important questions that impact you, your family, and your community. Such as, could I also be completely under the control of the father of a millionaire pop star? And do I need glasses, or is my Uncle Bill totally jacked? And now, the podcast host who updates his LinkedIn profile with only the slightest allusions to his heavy workout schedule, Pete Dominic. Hey, that's my name. That means I'll start talking. And I'm very excited to have you listening to episode 382 of Stand Up Pete Dominic Daily. Joining me today, Dr. Aaron Carroll talks about why mandates are good. And David Daly joins me to talk about why gerrymandering is real, real bad. So happy to have you join me here on the podcast today and every day I book it because I know a lot of people and uh, they generally like to talk to me. I host it. I prep for it. I got a big uh, couple of guests to prep for tomorrow. So I'm going to make this opening a little shorter than normal, probably because complicated, tough issues I've got to deal with with tomorrow's guests that I'm not as much familiar with. But I prepare for it. Of course, I edit it and I post and promote the podcast each and every day. And that's hopefully what you're paying for. If you haven't signed up for as little as five bucks, please sign up now. Go ahead. What are you waiting for? Patreon.com slash Pete Dominic. You can always up your subscription as well. And you get to be a part of our community, which is growing. And I'm so happy to have you along the ride of life with us. Every Thursday night, we hang out at 8 p.m. East. New people always showing up. Uh, the old folks, it's like Cheers Bar. It's awesome. We love it. We'd love to have you there if you've never joined us. Also, always on the Discord platform, there's folks to talk to as well. You're never alone if you're part of the Stand Up With Pete Dominic community. Also, if you've never reviewed this podcast on the Apple Podcast, please think of doing that. Throw it on your to-do list. That is uh, all I'm going to ask you to do for me today. Now, the rest is you sitting back, listening, learning, and laughing Along with me, the opening of every show, Monday through Thursday, I do the news on Friday. It's just usually the two guests because we hang out on Thursday night. And I've got that news for you. I put it together at night to get the freshest, hottest takes, audio, and more right now on The Last 24. Okay, the big story yesterday again was the weather, scorching temperatures, breaking records across the Pacific Northwest started to cool down uh, today, apparently, but uh, still really hot in the Northeast. The hottest day is going to be today. Apparently, it says that where I live, just north of New York City, it's going to be 97 degrees. So I'm glad there's an air conditioner in the shed and an above ground pool in the lawn. Also... Rescuers continue to search for any signs of life survivors in the horrific collapse of a building, a residential building, while people slept in Miami. And Jill Biden got to be on, is now on the cover of Vogue, something that Melania Trump never got. Of course, that's not the most important story, but I still wanted to mention it. For audio, I want to start by mentioning and sticking with the issue of climate. Here is Joe Biden. He was out in Wisconsin touting that the investments that he wants to make, if it can get done, would help America adapt to the changing climate and the climate crisis that we're living through. And so here he is yesterday in Wisconsin. You saw what happened in Texas this winter. The entire system in the state collapsed. The entire system That's why we have to act. This deal will modernize the power grid, be more energy efficient and resilient and resistant to extreme weather. And it's going to strengthen and revitalize our natural infrastructure, like our coastlines and levees, while preparing our physical infrastructure for wildfires, floods, and other extreme weather. All right, I don't know what was up with that sound, what that uh, kind of white noise was under it. Sorry about that, but. That wasn't on me or Keith. Don't blame us. Now, my friend Michael Mann, who was just on the show, co-wrote an op-ed in today's New York Times with a woman named Susan Joy Hassel, who is the director of nonprofit organization called Climate Communication. And in today's Times, under the headline, That Heat Dome? Yeah, it's climate change. They write, 
In the old days, we could escape the summer heat by heading north to the Adirondacks in the east or the cool forested Pacific Northwest in the west. But this is not your grandparent climate. They say, and though we're only one week into official summer, the characteristically cool Pacific Northwest has turned into a cauldron of triple-digit temperatures, with Portland, Oregon, Seattle reaching record highs of 115 and 108 degrees, respectively. That's unseasonably hot. Fort Phoenix! Anyway, I highly recommend that you read this. It's a great piece. Uh, And he says, there is a way out of this nightmare, they say of ever worsening weather extremes, and it's one that will serve us well in many other ways, too. A rapid transition to clean energy can stabilize the climate, improve our health, provide good-paying jobs, grow the economy, and ensure our children's future. The choice is ours. Well, the choice is ours to some extent in terms of who we have elected to the House and Senate and to our state and local governments that can make the necessary changes and investments for a better future for our kids and grandkids. But the real sticky situation right now is in the U.S. Senate and trying to reconcile these big spending bills and have what we need in terms of investment in climate. They've already, Democrats have already conceded a lot on the issue of energy infrastructure and investment. But here is Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez laying out the situation as it remains to try to get these bills done. The Senate has its chosen priority in a bipartisan bill, and the House has its priority in a rec- in its reconciliation bill. And so the Senate doesn't run the show. The Senate doesn't tell the White House what to do. What to do. The Senate doesn't tell the House what to do. They're a co-equal uh, partner in all of this. And so if the Senate really wants to run with their bipartisan bill, then and they want to get on that, then they should give on reconciliation. Yeah, so we're fighting amongst ourselves as progressives or Democrats or just not people who believe in conspiracy theory and white supremacy. And yet those folks, the other party, the Republican Party, which is really just a cult of Donald Trump, one man, is getting more and more extreme. Well, my friend Jeff Charlotte, who's written books about uh, the C Street House and the family and the right wing evangelicals and how they influence the federal government and state governments and so much more. He's at Dartmouth now. He's been on the show a bunch of times. He was on All In with Chris Hayes last night. And here's what he says about this movement and how much darker it's actually getting. It, it, it really has. You know, I've been uh, traveling across the country recently talking to Trump supporters all over. And so many people are are talking now about civil war. It's almost as if the, the spectrum ranges, whether they think it's coming or if they think it's January 6th was the first battle. And I think Trump sort of spoke to that feeling in his Ohio rally on Saturday, um, and which he, he, he sort of, he, he returned all the, the, his regular, his regular riffs, but darker, more violent. It was a long riff on, on, I mean, too grotesque, uh, hacking people to death and so on that he claims that undocumented people are doing. Um, and he's trying to scare people and it's working and they're cheering for it. They're enjoying the fear. Yeah. Okay. Well, the start of the show is pretty depressing. I'm sorry, folks. I realize I like I'm getting depressed by it. I don't want I don't want that to be the case. It's always a a, a difficult balance and trying to keep it light and 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 not so dark all the time. But yeah, starting with uh, uh, climate change, the building collapse, and obviously hearing Jeff Charlotte talking about civil war and how much darker the conservative movement has become in America, it's depressing. So sorry about that. Hope you're okay. You still listening? Don't turn it off. I have great conversations with Aaron Carroll and David Daly coming up. I think you're going to really like and still got the news dump. So you still with me? Check in and know the thoughts that you're thinking and be mindful and do all the things that you want to do to be healthy. Exercise, eat right, get nature, talk to the people you love, write in a journal, meditate, all the things that I try to do every day and Get like two of them done. Get a dog. Eat a snack. We feeling better yet? Okay, because this next thing is going to be back to uh, rage. This is Kevin McCarthy, who is a horrible, awful man. He's the House Minority Leader in the Republican House. And this is the guy that was left over after Paul Ryan and John Boehner skipped town. And he's got no ethics, no integrity, no principles. He's completely dishonest. And worst of all, he's stone cold stupid. 
And yesterday in the House, 120 Republicans voted against removing Confederate statues from the Capitol. And this is part of, I heard the whole thing. It's too much to play for all of it. It's just too awful. But here's part of Kevin McCarthy talking about this bill yesterday. All the statues being removed by this bill are statues of Democrats. Madam Speaker, as I heard the Speaker talk earlier about removing of the four portraits of speakers in the hall, the same answer goes for that as well. They were all Democrats. Yes, and things changed, and now the Democrats are the more anti-racist, anti-white supremacist political party, and that's why they want those statues of Democrats removed. Again, said simpler, Democrats want Democrats removed because those Democrats were also Confederates. That's not that hard to understand, but he's tried to trying to obfuscate the whole point. And anyway, the vote did pass, but 120 Republicans voted against it. The bill also called for removal of statues of non-notable, non-confeder- of notable non-Confederate Racists such as John Calhoun, Charles Brantley Aycock, and Roger Taney, who penned Supreme Court's notorious 1857 Dred Scott decision. So there you go. Tevin McCarthy, by the way, did vote for the bill. So did the second most influential person in the House, Steve Scalise, who has attended uh, some pretty sketchy gatherings with white supremacists, which is now what uh, Congressman Paul Gosar is doing. That was pretty controversial yesterday, but I'm not going to get into it. Anymore, And, uh, you know, who didn't, though? Elise Stefanik. Yeah, her newfound status is uh, Donald Trump's favorite. She voted no. She wants to keep Confederate statues up in the House. Also, Republicans who voted no. Lauren Boebert, Matt Gates, Paul Gosar, Marjorie Taylor Greene, and Jim Jordan, which is basically uh, a list of a hall of villains if they ever put those statues up. And here in response to Kevin McCarthy, by the way, is Congresswoman Karen Bass, who is actually a black woman and a Democrat and just absolutely nails it. We are extremely aware of our history of racism in the Democratic Party. And part of our history of Americans is that we criticize our country. We don't just honor the nice stories of our history, but we honor and embrace all all of our history, and we fight for a more perfect union. So fighting for a more perfect union for people of color meant fighting to enter the Democratic Party. And it is my hope that my colleagues on the other side of the aisle will go back to that history of the Republican Party that you honor and fight for the right for all Americans to vote. Thank you. Thank you, Congresswoman. Well done. Okay, well, there's a lot more that happened yesterday that I wanted to play for you, but I got to keep it a little bit tight because I got to prepare for tomorrow's guests. And I'm hosting a nonprofit for Nick D. Fabrizio tomorrow night. Kageno, you're all invited to come. I'll include a link in there in the show notes as well. But now it's time for everything else I can get out right now. Rapid fire style. It's the news dump. Here's Pete Coe with another news dump jingle. That should be upsetting. Trespassing hunter in the horse pen in a slump. The horse has kicked his face in for today's news dump. Oh my goodness. Uh, the, the, the hunter was trespassing and the horse is like a security horse, it, I feel like. And the, and the horse saw the hunter and, and kicked him right in the goddamn face. Now oh, that is a crazy news story. And speaking of other news, let's start in my home state, New York, where a major opioid epidemic trial began yesterday. New York and two of its largest counties in Long Island, Nassau and Suffolk, are holding a whole bunch of pharmaceutical companies and other corporations responsible for the deadly epidemic, accusing them of contributing to uh, all of it. Uh, Johnson & Johnson avoided the trial by settling for $230 million. CVS also settled with Nassau and Suffolk counties, but this is a massive trial and it could be a bellwether for other opioid cases across the country. Big news there and hopefully more justice will be done and uh, families who lost someone in the opioid epidemic will get some kind of small relief. And more importantly, these companies will hopefully have learned their lesson, but you know, we'll see if it's a moral hazard or just a fine you know, a cost of doing business. 
Ooh, I just saw this headline. Uh, there could be as much as 35 sudden deaths in Vancouver, British Columbia in, in the Northwest linked to the heat wave, according to police there. Mega drought and severe heat also causing dangerous conditions in California. And they always put out this heat wave safety manual. And I don't know. I always feel like if like it's I'm not talking about people who don't have resources and ability to, to find, you know, some kind of cooling station or relief. But it's like, don't leave your dog in the car. Thank you. Thanks for that manual. Appreciate that advice. Well, it's peak driving season and potentially peak driving weekend, right? Fourth of July weekend, highest gas price of 2021, casting a shadow over weekend road trips. However, you know what else is? Shitty weather. It's going to be either hot or rainy in many places over the Fourth of July weekend. So the Delta variant is wreaking havoc on unvaccinated communities. And even some folks with vaccinated who are vaccinated are, are, are still catching COVID, though it's a lot less severe. We'll talk about that with Dr. Carroll today. But I did see uh, New York, New Jersey, see the lowest COVID hospitalizations since the pandemic started. And so I think that's good news. And another story and a related story on COVID. One state's incentives are not working. And that state is Arkansas. Arkansas vaccine incentives apparently have not been effective. Only 42% of the state's population has one vaccine dose, according to the CDC. And their million-dollar program gave out an Arkansas lottery scholarship, $20 scratch-off ticket, or $20 gift certificate for the Arkansas Game and Fish Commission for first new doses. But apparently, uh, this just wasn't enough of an incentive. Health experts saying that Arkansas should refocus its efforts to combat the state's issues on access to free vaccines and hesitancy from residents if they truly want to pick up the pace. Now, here's a stupid but funny story. Apparently, John Bolton, who is a horrible person, who a cheerleader for every single war ever, of course, worked in Trump uh, in Trump's administration and then Trump uh, destroyed him when he quit. Anyway, he you know, he, he wrote a book. And news is coming out that apparently originally John Bolton wanted to name his book A Hard Pounding. That's right. He wanted to name the book A Hard Pounding. But the book publisher, who apparently is dishing this gossip, uh, warned him that he thought that, that would probably denote a sexual connotation for, for some people. Even though Bolton said it's a quote from the Duke of Wellington after the Battle of Waterloo. I don't know what happened after the Battle of Waterloo, but uh, that's hilarious. I don't even know what his book eventually got called, and I don't give a shit. I just thought that was funny that he wanted to call his book a hard pounding. God, I hope he gets one one day. Sorry. Sorry. And it's June, so the Supreme Court continuing to put its decisions out, and they are leaving a pandemic-inspired nationwide ban on evictions in place. Over the votes of four objecting conservative justices, the court on Tuesday rejected a plea by landlords to end the CDC as a moratorium on evicting millions of tenants who aren't paying rent during the coronavirus pandemic. Last week, the Biden administration extended the moratorium by a month till the end of July. So the high court voted 5-4 to keep the ban in place till the end of July. And that is really good news. A new study says that cities are losing shade. They're losing their shady spots, and the change is mainly affecting communities where people of color live. (sighs) Neighborhoods that are majority-minority have about a third less tree canopy. Neighborhoods that are mostly populated with households living below the poverty line have 41% less cover. So if you live in poverty and certain uh, communities of color, now you have one more thing to struggle with. You can't even find shade. These findings come from America's, uh, the American Forest Tree Equity Score Report, a first ever tally of America's trees, according to The Guardian. And I read this last story, which is a good story, finally, uh, about two women who worked at the same place and knew each other and chatted in the bathroom. And it might have saved both of their husbands' lives because they found out that both their husbands needed kidney transplants and that each one of these women matched the other one's husband. Talk about swapping spouses. This is swapping kidneys. And it's just a great story. One couple's a black family. The other couple's a white family. And it's just it's just a really good kind of story, I think. Right now, we needed one of those. And I highly recommend look up uh, this story in, well, everybody's reporting it. Good Morning America, Washington Post. 
And while we're on good stories, I saw this one. 60 years after she was denied, she's now the Yankees' back girl. Gwen Goldman was turned down at age 10 because of her gender. Well, now she's 70 years old, and Monday night, a full 60 years after she was turned down because she was a girl, she got to be a back girl. Gwen Goldman looked that one up. And finally, a hiker missing eight days was miraculously found alive in the Pacific Northwest. And uh, that's a good story coming out of a hot-baked area. All right, that is today's news dump. Now it's time to get to my first guest. You know him, you love him. He's one of the all-time greats here on Stand Up Yesterday. Our friend Sandor up in Vancouver uh, sent me a tweet, me and Aaron, that he just bought his book. Aaron's book, The Bad Food Bible, and he shared a picture. Aaron re- replied saying that made his day. And you too can tweet Aaron. That'll make him really happy. He's now uh, the chief health officer at Indiana University School of Medicine. He's a professor of pediatrics. He's also the host of Healthcare Triage, which is a hit YouTube channel that he's won journalism awards for. It's awesome. Check that out uh, because he goes deeper into what we are about to talk about here the, the history of vaccines. He, of course, is the, an author, several books, tweets at Aaron E. Carroll and contributes to The New York Times, where this piece that we talked about appeared this week, both in the hard copy and online. Always so proud of my pal. One of my best friends in the whole world. My latest conversation with Dr. Aaron Carroll. There he is, Dr. Aaron Carroll, the chief something or other of Indiana University. Chief, chief health officer. Chief health officer. I was going to call you the chief medical officer. Now, would that be insulting? Chief medical versus no, chief health? I would, I would I would, correct you because it's like we're, we're trying to do also health and public health and not just medicine. And so I, this is more of a health than medical. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure we all understand the difference between public health and medical. So I don't need to, I don't need to explain that because everybody listening obviously knows. And obviously sure. I know totally the difference between right. that. So your new piece, I want to talk with you about, I, I'm sure it's, it's stirred up some controversy of those reading it. It's in the New York Times, of course, which is in, it's in the print version, never gets old. Did you get it? Did you pick it up? Oh, no, yeah, I did. And it doesn't good. ever get old. Like, it's right back here. Yes. Oh, good, good. I, uh, I, I realize I don't get it the daily anymore. And I was like, oh, I hope you got it. Vaccine mandates are coming. Good. That's the title of the piece. I didn't write the title, but that, I know, you know, but the I, editors always write the title. And I'm always like, move. They know how to get clicks. That'll, yeah, that'll yeah. That, that's what I thought. Like, I mean, obviously, they know how to get clicks. And that's that's the currency we all traffic in now, uh, unfortunately. But good is a real summation of... I guess a somewhat simple premise, really. I mean, it's. I don't think it's entirely wrong. It's just probably not the way I might have phrased it. But I mean, I get what they're doing. It, you know, it works. Uh, how how complicated is it? How how much can you see? You know, other arguments around this. Well, more importantly, what does it mean? Uh, vaccine mandates. I mean, it just it, it means that we're going to require vaccines, and if not, then there will be some you know penalty for not doing it. And you know, of course, what makes me laugh about this was it's not terribly different than the discussions we used to have over the individual mandate for the ACA, which is a tax. It's like it means it's a you know when we talk about behavioral modification and we talk talk about behavioral economics or changing people's behavior, you know, it always comes down to carrots and sticks. Carrots are the lotteries, the cash giveaways, the free beer, uh, donut, um, a joint, uh, and a scholarship. Yes. Yes, depending on scholarship, whatever it is, you know, those are the those I'm are the counting counts. on that mandates. New York State for Ava. We entered her. We are counting on winning, yeah. sir. That's our college yeah. plan. Man- mandates are the sticks. Yeah. Mandates are the, uh, the, you know, it's the penalties or the bad things that might happen, or, you know, the, the negative consequences if you don't do the action. And so uh, we have been pushing, pushing, pushing with carrots. But once in a while, you got to bring out sticks. But you bring, you know, you bring up the mandate and that was a, a mandatory fee that you had to pay if you did not. Yeah get health insurance. In this case, Dr. Carroll, you want to strap children down and vaccinate them. I do not. Uh, you are do not. a witch and a monster. No, I mean, it's, you know, again, the mandate for the ACA was a tax. A mandate for a cruise ship is you can't go on a cruise vacation this year. In this case, uh, you know, the mandate for us is uh, if, you know, you want to be part of the IU community this year uh, in an active way, we need people to either be vaccinated or apply and get an exemption. And there are religious exemptions, there are medical exemptions, um, and those who qualify will absolutely get them. But everyone else, we're, we're asking people to get met. We're asking people to get vaccinated. That's how we keep the community safe. 
What is an example of a religious exemption? Are they like uh, the, the, the Christian scientists or Jehovah's Witness? Who, who are the are the Orthodox Jewish? Who are we, the... are, we are trusting our constituents to attest that they have a religious objection and then approving it. So, again, um, so they don't have pretty... to. Nobody has to say what they're really. They don't have to spell it out. You could just no. anybody. You could be an atheist and not want to get the vaccine and just say. Uh, religious exemption. And, and I suppose. I mean, you're attesting. So we're trusting that people are telling us the truth. And of course, you know, lying always has consequences, be it a medical religious exemption. But how would how would how would anybody know? Um, so we're we are relying on people to do the right thing. Um, we're relying on our constituents to still tell the truth. Um, but we are we're approving religious exemptions. We've, you know, left and right. Uh, you go so into that? you go into a little bit of history here in this column, yes. which is interesting because. Some people will make the argument about the military and winning and losing. I, I think it's kind of a good way to, to open the piece with the history and also looking at mandates in, in the military are what helped America become America, apparently. Uh, it's, well, I'm going to tell the story, but I will also, I'll tell the story, but also tell a little editorial. You'll get a little behind the scenes action All here. Right. Like in many drafts, that, that part of the piece went from the top to the bottom to the top to the bottom, whether people thought we should lead with something else or whether people thought we should leave with that story. And um, that, that won the day. And I actually think it's stronger that way. Oh, wow. Amy was the first, my wife was the first one to suggest moving it to the top, but then it kept getting shifted around. But here's the story. Um, I think we even talked about, you know, think we touched on some of this last time. I mean, anti-vaccine sentiment has been around as long as vaccines. Um, and, you know, back in the day in the 1700s, uh, really one of the big arguments was about variolation, which is inoculation with smallpox matter, which which would protect you against smallpox disease, but still was pretty dangerous, um, but nowhere near as dangerous as smallpox. Um, vaccination or variolation with or inoculation with smallpox material was very common in Europe, um, not so common in America, where we were very anti, you know, very against it. In fact, the Continental Congress in 1776 passed a law prohibiting um, any surgeon army, army surgeons from inoculating anyone. They basically said, can't do it. Um, but Washington's army was getting decimated by smallpox. And it was a real problem because, again, the British were immune. But his own conscripts or his own soldiers were not. And smallpox outbreaks kept happening. And so in 1777, he finally bit the bullet and told Congress, I'm vaccinating all the, the, the army people. And he had to keep it a secret because you could get a little sick after this. And he didn't want the British attacking. But he he implemented a mandate for the Revolutionary Army to be vaccinated with smallpox. Very unpopular, arguably helped contribute to the win um, because there were throughout the Southern campaign, no outbreaks that took down a division or a regiment while, you know, those fighting for the British who often were, uh, you know, slaves who'd been freed um, with because the British said, hey, we'll we'll defend your freedom if you want to fight. And others who joined the British side were not inoculated against smallpox and they were often really ravaged by the disease. Um, and so. A vaccine mandate with by Washington arguably helped win the Revolutionary War. Like, as I argued, like, I think, you know, mandates are part of our foundational fabric to, to argue that they're un-American or have no place in history is, is ignoring history. I wonder, are people really saying they're un-American? I mean, you, you look at. Yes. Oh, my God. They said it for the ACA. They said, like, you're, it's tyranny. Remember, mandates are tyranny. Oh, yeah. So, that was, yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, tyranny is 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 a word often used when uh, along with the words uh, confiscation of your money. Like there's tyranny and they're confiscating well, your money. Through taxes, tyranny is but. the opposite of freedom. Freedom is America. America is about you know whatever. <laughs> yeah. You know how it works. Nearly all major infectious diseases you write in the country: measles, mumps, rubella, pertussis. I say that right? Diphtheria yes, and more have been managed through vaccine mandates yeah. by schools specifically. We're talking K through a million. Yeah. Well, no, it's even further than that. By Indiana law, for instance, we are required as IU to to mandate, you know, vaccination against six major diseases. Most of the ones I think you just mentioned. We're also <clears throat> told to implement other vaccine mandates as we deem fit uh, in order to provide for safety and to make sure that everyone is vaccinated or has an, an exemption, basically to do what we are doing for COVID. We're mandated by law to do that for measles, mumps, rubella, and, and a couple other diseases, even at the, the college level, because 
Vaccination against vaccine preventable infectious diseases is what what schools have always done, um, or not always, but for a long time, it's what schools have done to both keep schools safe and also to help protect the population. Because, of course, as we vaccinate all children over time, they become vaccinated adults, and therefore we achieve massive herd immunity to these diseases over time. And that's why COVID. Problem with COVID is it's an emergency. We don't have decades to wait here, um, which is why I think you're seeing, you know, more of a push, or at least I argued we need more of a push for this than we might otherwise do in the past. The problem with COVID is that it's an emergency, and so that the mandates being put in place are are less uh, popular because of people's concerns around emergency vaccine. Is that what you're saying? Because, because well, mandates are never popular. First of all, it's like, I mean, let's own it. Like, it's just not, I mean, I never expect, pub- in fact, most public health measures are not popular. That's unfortunate because they often work. Um, but I think also, th- you know, this one's become politicized. This one's become uh, territorial. This one's become, you know, everyone's got a team. Uh, and so there's short term massive resistance for a variety of reasons that often have nothing to do with public health. But, you know, lots of people have resistance to it for a variety of reasons. Overcoming that um, requires, you know, careful, thoughtful, diligent con- you know, communication, especially from trusted voices. How closely are you tracking schools across the country or even across the world that are instituting mandates? Is, is it well, a blue I don't state? have to because the Chronicle does. So the Chronicle of Higher Education does. And so there's they have a database that they publicly share that has over 500 colleges and universities in America so far have 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 mandates. OK, you're talking about colleges and universities. What about like K through 12? Are we going to K- see? Man- well, remember, we can't mandate. We can't mandate K through 12. The vaccine's not even approved for kids. You know, of course, of that's, I know that. So that question came from the chat. I would, oh. I'm not stupid. Oh, okay. I know so, so, I mean, like, you could talk about mandating it in high schools, but <laughs> um, but, you know, it, you can't mandate in elementary school. You can't right. mandate it in right. middle school. And so and I think that. You know, first of all, like schools are all over the map because they are, you know, often managed at a very local level. So I imagine some may try to mandate it, some may not. Um, but but it will be harder to mandate it at a local level because, uh, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know. I don't know if anyone's keeping track. There are so many, you know, elementary schools and I'm sorry, there's so many high schools across the country. I don't know that there's a database to track that yet. When will the vaccines be approved for uh, very young kids? I, oh, for very young kids. I, I hear different things. I mean, some people think optimistically even by the fall, mm. uh, but potentially um, I think, you know, early 2022 at the latest. Uh, I think one of the reasons we're not seeing or potentially one of the reasons we're not seeing FDA approval yet for the, the, the Moderna and the Pfizer is because there's probably some level of concern that the second that something's approved by the FDA can be given off label. And there will be parents of young children who will start demanding it for their kids immediately. And I think the FDA is worried about, you know, how that would play out and how that would go. It might be one of the reasons that it's taken, you know, we're still everyone's screaming, when will they be approved? And as we've talked about before, we don't need any more safety and efficacy data to approve these. It's more dotting eyes and crossing T's. Uh, I think this is one of the problems that's there. Uh, getting back to the mandates, we're talking mostly about schools, colleges, universities, of course, but um, we're, we're also talking about cruise ships. We're talking about workplaces, places of employment, yeah. right? The healthcare systems, almost all the healthcare systems in Indiana have also mandated for their employees and staff. Um, uh, so, you know, there, there are protests and arguments all over the place, but um, a number of our health I mean, there's that one in Texas, which has made a lot of news because it's the one that's had a lawsuit so far. Um, but I expect, especially once we get to FDA approval, um, some have held that up as a reason not to, 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 go, to go to war yet. But uh, I think more and more companies and or uh, organizations will likely do this for a variety of reasons. One, it saves your company a ton of money um, because preventing a COVID hospitalization, especially amongst older adults, is massively cost benefiting. Um, Not to mention it probably keeps everybody safer and, you know, removes a lot of anxiety about work. So, you know, there'll always have to be exemptions. There'll always be medical exemptions. There will always be religious exemptions. Our goal is not 100 percent, as you and I have discussed many times with public health. More is better than perfect. Our goal is to get lots and lots and lots of people vaccinated. And when you make something the default, more people do it. Do you see any, you know, all of the arguments uh, against mandates. Do you see any that are, you know, reasonable that you can hear and and, and not dismiss out of hand? Or are they all to you? I I try not to dismiss any. I know. I know. I know you don't. You're a very thoughtful guy. But I mean, like, but but but. 
Uh, these are yeah. real concerns. Do you think any of them are worth? Well, again, it's like the problem is that um, at a population level, no, but at an individual level, yes. Like uh, I think that, you know, some people, even with tons of conversation, um, you know, either it's a medical reason or a religious reason or something like, so it's like at some point I'm not going to win every heart and mind. And I'm, I'm yeah. okay with that. Again, our goal is not perfection. We, we do, we've been doing this with, with like other vaccines for, for a long, long time, like there are kids that go to school that aren't vaccinated. Like it happens, but we've made it the default that you should get vaccinated and you need to jump through hoops not to be vaccinated. And because of that, most kids get vaccinated. It's not 100 percent of kids against MMR. It's probably like 90. Mm. Um, but that's that's enough. Like right. That's enough. It's like that. That's where we've got to get to with COVID. I'm not trying to get to 100 percent. I'm just trying to make it the default to make it a nudge, to make it more difficult not to be vaccinated than to be vaccinated. And all of those drive us closer and closer to the levels that we need to be safe enough. What do you say about the Delta variant? Is it breaking through the vaccinated folk? It's less that it's breaking through the vaccinated folk than it's tearing through the unvaccinated. Um, and it, it does. There will be. Let's be clear. The vaccines are not 100 percent effective. So the more disease that is out there, the more likely people, even vaccinated people are to be infected. But most of the people getting infected right now are unvaccinated. And pretty much all the deaths are in the unvaccinated, because even if it does break through into an infection in a vaccinated person, there are most often are not asymptomatic or not very sick. So the Delta variant is bad at a population level, but it, as a vaccinated person, it doesn't scare me individually as a population level person. It does because it's, it's much more, it's more infectious. People are lowering their guard because they think COVID's gone. Um, and therefore it can very rapidly get through an unvaccinated population. And lots of people in the United States are still unvaccinated. Well, Adam in Minnesota writes, uh, last question, I got the J uh, Johnson Johnson vaccine because that's what was available when my turn popped up. I did what was advised, get whatever you can when it's your time. But it's pretty obvious that the Pfizer and Moderna are much better. I really wanted those shots based on how much uh, of an amazing scientific breakthrough they are. So I have less protection than most people. My wife also got the Johnson Johnson. The Delta variant is bad. Aaron, should we go get the Pfizer? This guy wants to get I another vaccine. This is where I would say you got to you got to go with local and CDC guidance. I think they're still saying no, but I would not be surprised if we find that the Delta becomes prevalent and J&J &J is not cutting it. We just don't know yet. Then I think they will adjust guidance and they will say, OK, yes, people who got J&J &J may need to be. But again, this is how it is with all vaccines. If we find that, that immun immunity is waning, we're going to boost her, um, whether it's because of a variant or because it's because of time. I think as, if evidence starts showing up that that people would benefit from being boosted, we will boost her. Um, and if that means getting a different vaccine, that's what it means. If it, gets, it means getting another dose, that's what it means. But we're waiting for the evidence. And at the moment, the evidence doesn't, I think, say that, that people mm -hmm. who got J&J &J need to rush out and get another vaccine. I know you got to go. You went to camp. Your kids go to camp. Why is camp a thing that you support? Sending your kids great. sleep away well, camp for weeks I mean, at a time. For me personally, it was freedom. Like, you know, I lived under a pretty strict household and like that was when I got to be Aaron Carroll and like make make decisions for myself. I probably grew up and matured a huge amount at camp. And ironically enough, of all my childhood friends, the people that I probably stay in touch with the most happen to be uh, camp friends. But for me, it was a huge growth opportunity um, and a chance to to sort of be in more in control of me. And, uh, you know, that was irreplaceable and, you know, absolutely priceless. There you go. Another resounding uh, support for camp. Love camp. Thank you very much for talking to me today. I really appreciate it, pal. Anytime. Yes, there he goes. Please go tell him how much you appreciate. He doesn't do as much media anymore, but he always says yes to me at Aaron E. Carroll. And he's such a great communicator. Go subscribe to his YouTube channel, Healthcare Triage. While you're there, subscribe to mine, youtube.com slash stand up. And I'll get this interview up today. How about that? If I try to get this interview up, I'll, 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 I'm going to make an effort. I've got young Vince Leaf helping me out now with video. He's doing an excellent job. If you haven't checked out the YouTube channel, check it out and I'll get Aaron up ASAP. Follow him on Twitter. Subscribe to his YouTube channel. Read that New York Times piece. Let me know what you think about the vaccine mandates. And thanks for the question to Adam. If you've got questions for my guests or for me or about anything, email me. Stand up with Pete 
at gmail.com. All right, my second guest on today's program now joins me. He is an author. He is a journalist. He is the former editor-in-chief of Salon.com. So we could talk about, well, pretty much anything. And we cover a lot of ground in this conversation today. His most recent book is Unrigged, How Americans Are Battling Back to Save Democracy. Also the author of, author of Rat Fucked, Why Your Vote Doesn't Count. And he's written a new piece at The Guardian about why redistricting and gerrymandering is going to really help Republicans in this next election. We talked about that and a lot more media analysis, criticism. And I really enjoyed it. I love this guy. Super smart. Really happy to have him on the show again. Please tell him you heard him on the show. He's on Twitter at David Daily 3 and you can get more uh, information in the show notes in today and every day's show. And we start right, by the way, in the middle of a history lesson he's given me based on a book he just learned about in terms of uh, the Revolutionary War and, and racism. Here it is. South Carolina, the legislature voted to surrender to the British after the British took over Savannah and were headed towards Charleston. And they had to be cajoled and forced multiple time and time again into coming back into the Union. They would, they would rather have surrendered to the British than armed black slaves to fight in the war. We'll get to your article, but I, I read your article, and I just want to tease it by saying it's the worst thing I've read in a year. Not writing, not research-wise, it's probably one of the most important things I've read, but it was worse, and then it, 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 didn't, it didn't make me feel great. So I'm saving that for the latter part of our conversation. You got it. And now we're just going to talk, because you're a really intelligent, smart, experienced, thoughtful, opinionated guy. I loved our first conversation. I love your book. I love your honesty. And you really, you strike me as a, just a really genuinely uh, good fella, like... I don't know, sometimes you can just tell, right? And so I, was, I wanted to ask you what you thought about kind of what's wrong with today's political media. Would you be interested? I should have said this off air. Would you be interested in a little bit of a conversation about that? Sure, happily. Because you're someone who, who has experience in pretty much all types of media. And I often get trapped in this idea that not that most people don't pay as close attention to, to politics as I do. But what do you think, and you can answer this, there's no wrong answer, I suppose, is wrong with American political media in, in any way, shape, or form? It's such a terrific question, and it's such an important question, and there are so many ways that this can go. What? The reason I ask this, maybe you could take it this way, is I'm think, sitting here thinking about you, thinking, I wonder what his media diet's like. Like, I like to ask smart people what their media, like, really, what it looks like. What do you read? Where do you go? And then why don't you go here? So right. I'm sorry to interrupt you there, but that would be a no. way to take it. Um, and I'm happy to talk to, uh, about that. What I think is the most important story that nobody talks about when they think about media criticism in this country is that the right wing has been involved in a 50-year exercise to undermine the authority and legitimacy of the mainstream media. This is not something that starts with Fox News. This goes back decades and decades, and it's quite an intentional project to sort of undermine our belief in, um, in facts and in, in the possibility of objectivity. Um, and it's extraordinarily dangerous, and I think we saw it during this pandemic, right? I mean, you see it if you compare what's on the air at eight o'clock on MSNBC versus what's on the air at eight o'clock on Fox. Um, it can be the same story and you don't even recognize it. Right. But if you go back to what Richard Nixon and Pat Buchanan and Spiro Agnew were up to in the days after Nixon's election in 68, um, you begin to see the roots of this 50-year project to sort of undermine the collective notion of, of, of truth and facts. 
And that's what's brought us to this place where we can't have a conversation with anybody. Um, along the way, they've weaponized sort of the mainstream media's objective notion of both sides, right? Um, mm-hmm. So they've, they've, they've quite neatly figured out how, how to use that against the mainstream media. But the more important piece of this, I think, is the way that they've assaulted directly uh, and built up their own infrastructure over a a period of decades um, to compete, not on the basis of facts, but on the basis of, uh, frankly, propaganda. Yeah, well, I'm trying to think of like how you would describe the mainstream media or what it, it the way it does its work. But I guess the way I kind of look at right wing media is their main concern is making money. And nowadays it's that means getting clicks. And, and, and how do you do that? You be provocative. You, 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 you make things very binary, this or that. You create enemies. You tell people how to feel. I mean, all media does that. But it's it, it, it's almost solely that I'm, I'll never forget. I forget who did it. One of the people who covered Fox News a lot, a Vanity Fair reporter or something like riding in to work with Bill O'Reilly. And Bill O'Reilly's looking at the ratings book like the night before in the minute to minute. And then he matches up with what he's talking about. And so it's a, it's clearly a strategy to be to get good ratings, to get people to watch you. And how do you do that? that? That's, and, that's, that's absolutely true. And I mean, I ran Salon for five years, so I've done I've done similar things. Right. We have chart beat. You know, every single newsroom in this country has got Chartbeat, uh, which is a, a a digital system that tells you exactly how many people are on your site, where they came from, what they're reading, and how long they're staying on it. And Chartbeat is pumped into the bloodstream of of modern American media. It doesn't matter if it's if it's, if it's liberal media, conservative media. The mainstream media. Um, when I visited the Washington Post a couple of years ago, the chart beat screen hangs over the newsroom. You know, it's not Woodward and Bernstein's Pulitzer. It's, it, it, you know, it's a giant chart beat. Um, and that fuels your priorities. Um, and it can really warp your priorities. Um, it can tell you what villain is, is, is working in that moment. It can tell you what sort of the outrage of the day is registering and which one isn't. Um, you can change your sense of who the villain is. We at Salon would oftentimes, you know, we'd have our villains too, you know, whether it was Laura Ingram or um, Ann Coulter or whoever else it might be at the moment. And Chartbeat could tell you whether a story framed in that way was working or not working. Uh, I mean, Chartbeat also told us that our audience was really into stories about, you know, neuroscience and, um, and religion. And so we gave them more of that, but it also told us that our audience really was interested in stories on, on generational warfare. And so you find yourself leaning into that as well. So what does that do to the work? I mean, that, that's kind of like, it's kind of interesting, the project that I'm doing, that the Substack is doing, that anybody who is just kind of doing their own media and getting paid directly by the listener, viewer, reader. And there's pros and cons to that for sure. Probably mostly, I feel like it's mostly bad because you're mostly going to be, the people who really make a lot often are super provocative, certainly on podcasts and YouTube. And writing right. is obviously different, but it's still a probably an issue. What do you think about this new model of commentary? I don't know if you'd even call a lot of it journalism, but a lot has changed almost away from the anti-corporate model. And by the way, I think the best thing you can do, and I'm a good example of this, is is be in corporate media for 10 years or more and then go do your own thing where you've built up a certain currency reputation and credibility or not. And, and then maybe you can survive and I'm just surviving here in in the shed and and loving my work though. What do you think about where we're at now and what might be positive with the way things are trending in the media or is it mostly getting worse? I think there are some positive things. You know, I think that there are terrific um, nonprofits that have, developed that are covering state government in in really detailed ways that newspapers once did and surrendered, you know, if not a decade ago, decades Mm -hmm. ago, 
perhaps. Um, I mean, my first job was at the Hartford Current um, mm-hmm. out of out of school, and I was one of 200 reporters in the state system at the Hartford Current, and we covered every single town in the state. They had a bureau of about six people in Washington and uh, probably eight another eight people at the state capitol covering politics every day. The Hartford Current is now down to about a dozen reporters in general at the entire newspaper. And that's so, just to be clear, it's a capital of, of the state of Connecticut. It's the, it's the a newspaper that would cover the state legislation. and yeah, Which was literally across the street from the newspaper, yeah. right? I mean, the capitol building was a 30-second walk. You'd walk out the front door and you'd practically be there. Um, and... Uh, Hartford is not alone in that, you know, it's, it's, it's just about every, you know, every, every state capital in many ways has become a news desert. Um, and the politicians can get away with whatever they want to in a news desert. They are able to do a lot more in committee hearings and behind closed doors than to just, you know, tuck things deep into legislation or go, or go late into the night when there's only a couple of reporters who cover everything that's going on. It's, it's impossible. So I think that, that that's a positive that there's, there's, there's been this, this new foundation individual funding model that has helped build back some of the boring stuff, you know, some of the institutional stuff that newspapers once did, but haven't done for a long time and kind of remains on the on the cutting room floor but i think you're absolutely right about 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 substack and about a lot of these subscription models i think you can suddenly make a career if you are able to sort of build a brand and deliver something of interest to people that they're willing to pay for um the problem with so many newspapers in this country is they're not delivering anything that anybody finds worth paying for and so if you or, you know, Anne Helen Peterson or, you know, Matthew Iglesias or Glenn Greenwald or whoever else you're you're talking about or or supporting is doing this work and it's important to you, you are able to fund them directly. Yeah. Uh, and that can lead to a real living for people. I feel like some of the issues that deserve to be covered the most the, that that the American citizen or, or that are in the, the, the greatest uh, interest of the public they're boring or they are unfolding over a long period of time. I think about these things a lot, tax policy, trade and climate, you know, climate is a little sexier, but still it's, it's, you know, here we are in this horrible heat wave. We always tend to talk about it more when we're experiencing extreme weather, but yet, you know, it's, what do you do when you're at salon and, you know, or even, I mean, like your book is, as as sexy as we can make saving democracy, you know, but you really had to, to, to work hard to make it interesting because it's, it can be boring. These issues, voting issues can be boring, but, but, and people tune right out. I mean, the most important issues are often the boring issues. And if they're boring, no one's buying that paper. No one's clicking on that. Therein lies your problem. I don't know how to fix that. I'm Well, what we did at Salon was we tried to surround the stuff that we thought our audience wanted to read, whether that was the latest outrage on Fox or the hot clip from John Stewart or Stephen Colbert. And you surround that with as much smart, insightful commentary that you can possibly do. And then you pick the best stories that you can possibly go out and tell reported. And you, you know, when Chartbeat can help you on some of those stories, it can tell you where to invest on the, on the, on the, uh, on the stories that feel like dessert uh, or the stories that are kind of catnip on social media. Right. Um, but so you, you generate the numbers you have to generate there and then you spend the rest of the time, ideally, if you're doing it right, trying to dive in on on what matters. And so we, you know, hired you know David Dayan and Brian Boitler and Alex Perrine and Roxanne Gay and mm-hmm. Steve Karnacki and you know all of these amazing people uh, who we kind of helped give you know a launch to sure. um, to 
go off and do their work. And, you know, oftentimes what was carrying the site that day was a, a clip from the Colbert Report. But that was allowing us to give all of these other amazing people the time and the space they needed to go off and, and do great work. Well, you owe me a lot of gratitude because I warmed up the audiences on almost every episode of the Colbert Report. So, I mean, I feel like I deserve... I mean, I I do have a uh, what's it called a Peabody, which I didn't even think hey. you, I didn't even think you qualified for as like a member of the crew. But yeah, I have a uh, I have a Peabody, but it's it's not. A <laughs> How is your fitness, David? How are you? <laughs> you told me you're fifty. Are you in good? Is everything is everything working? Men need to talk with each other about our plumbing, et cetera, and so on. Yeah, you know, uh, we actually haven't got the Peloton in the middle. Oh, of, look uh, at you, the oh, bike. The pandemic. There's a treadmill uh, no, as well. Treadmill, you know, I don't want to kill my kid. Yeah. Um, but <laughs> that's what I was gonna say. I hope you didn't get the treadmill. It's a, it's a weapon, apparently. <laughs> it's a death trap. It's a suicide wrap, as we were talking about earlier. Let's see. Yeah. I mean, a horrible thing. Yeah. That's yes. So you got the yeah. Peloton, and you are are you telling me that you and your your spouse, your partner, your wife, you you share it? We share it. Oh, we wow. do. You know, we oh, cool. we have to wipe it down. Yeah. But, All um, right. We share it. Yeah, it's sitting there in the bedroom. It, it um, you know, it haunts us. Is what it does. <laughs> it's waiting there, looking at you, judging you. If you don't Staring do it, it just me. come on, Dave. <laughs> you know all that wine and ice cream and sadness. It's not going to disappear on its own. You're right about. Everybody knows what the wine and ice cream. They don't realize how important cardio is for stress and anxiety and depression. It's a game changer. Cardio it and is. nature. It is two best things. You know? And they have those new wave rides. I mean, I never thought I'd be spinning to the Sisters of Mercy. You know what it's like, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hey, now, hey, now, now, sing this corrosion to me. Oh, my <laughs> God. Going harder and harder, you know? Yeah. That's, it's really. The tunes it, of my goth 80s childhood, I am now trying to take off the pandemic weight to repeat. Uh, you would have never told me this. You're a goth kid? I was I was an 80s alternate kid. I would I you know, I mean, I loved my cure and Sisters of Mercy and and Bauhaus and the Smiths. And yeah. but did you go are you talking music? Did you go uh, fall in? Did you do the clothes? I mean, my brother I mean, was like I told you, I grew up in Hartford, Connecticut. Right. So right. There was not really any full, you know, um, when we would sneak out of the house and go see the cure, we would dress up. Oh, absolutely. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, well, let me. I'll spare you all those pictures. Uh, no, please send them. Mm -hmm. I'll put them in today's show links. Yeah, that's that's exactly my fear. Uh, <laughs> so you've written a couple of books about uh, democracy and voting in America. You're one of the foremost experts at uh, your your most recent article is really very important, and I hope gets a lot of attention. The Guardian linked, and we'll t we're going to talk about that. But first, I I just got to get. Your kind of overall, we're talking about media and politics, but your kind of overall analysis of where we're at. So much important conversation happening uh, about the fight for voting rights, which is not a thing. I bet you, you know a lot more than me, but I bet you, you didn't think we'd be talking about voting rights in 2021 when, I don't know, 2010 or when the Voting Rights Act was still being supported by the entire Senate every however many years. No, it's really true. You know, when you go back to 2006, the Voting Rights Act is reauthorized almost unanimously right, right. by both houses of Congress. And it's 98 nothing in the Senate and it's like 387 to 30 in the House. I'm 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 guesstimating there, but but it's 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 in that ballpark. But in the roots of that reauthorization in 2006, I think in some ways is where we are now, because there, there was a conservative but not insane member of Congress from Wisconsin, James Sensenbrenner, mm -hmm. uh, who just re retired in the last House. And Sensenbrenner chaired the House a Judiciary a Committee, and Republicans were term limited out as chair. So Sensenbrenner looked over his shoulder and there was a man from Texas, Lamar Smith, who was next in line to become chair. And he called up Mel Watt from North Carolina, a, a black congressman from North Carolina, the one of the uh, first in 90 years. And he called Mel in 2005 and said, hey, there's a chance you might take back the House in 2006. 
There's a chance you might not, in which case Lamar Smith is going to be ranking member. And if you do and you become chair, you're going to have to deal with him anyway. So how about if you and I make a deal and we reauthorize the Voting Rights Act right now together and do it for a longer period of time than has ever happened before? Sensenbrenner saw the crazies in his party coming. Wow. I've never heard anything about that. Do you write about that in one of the books? I have a story in the New Republic that uh, uh, last fall that tells this story. I'll send you the link. When when you say saw the crazy coming, describe what he saw coming and describe maybe where we are at yeah. right now in well, America. What Sensenbrenner saw coming was that Someone like Lamar Smith from Texas was beginning to bristle under preclearance, which the, the Voting Rights Act, perhaps the uh, two most important pieces, right, are Section 4 and Section 5, which set out the standards by which uh, states that had had a history of, ra of racial prejudice in their voting laws. They had to uh, bring those laws before the Department of Justice or uh, a special court in Washington, D.C. before they were able to make any change. Which was the, the crowning achievement of the civil rights movement that lasted a generation or more. It was the, it was this people fought and died and marched and boycotted and organized and dedicated their entire lives to yeah. making these changes. And they won after loss, after loss, after loss, after hundreds of years, really, of fighting. Again. And they won and they and they pass these laws that you're now talking about being reasserted uh, every, every so often. And I just I just kind of wanted to color they it. Won. Yeah. They won, but that law helped hold back hundreds of horrible laws that jurisdictions across all of these states wanted to enact. Sensenbrenner and Watt, because they recognized what was happening among Republicans like Smith from Texas and other states in the South, and because they recognized that the conservative legal establishment was about to mount an assault on the Voting Rights Act, which culminated in the Shelby County decision, which gutted Section 4 and Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act because Chief Justice John Roberts, who's made it his life's work to undermine the Voting Rights and the Voting Rights Act specifically, declared that there was a new day in the South and this wasn't necessary any longer. And that very afternoon, that very afternoon, Texas puts its draconian voter ID law into place. So what Sensenbrenner and Watt did, they went out and they held hearings and they generated 13,000 pages of hearings in 2006 about why the Voting Rights Act, specifically Section 4 and Section 5, were still necessary in all of these states. And they were they were visionaries and seers on this. John Roberts and the other four conservative justices, the robed ideologues in that voting rights wrecking crew, ignored <laughs> what is the most voluminous congressional history attached to any law, I believe, in in modern history, if not all of congressional history. So that's what Sensenbrenner and Watt were trying to do because they recognized both the assault that was coming on this bill from conservative lawmakers and they recognized what was happening inside conservative legal wings, inside the Federalist Society and all of these organizations that were eager to undermine the heart of the Voting Rights Act. There's so many different things that have hijacked our democracy in, in America, and we can talk more about voting rights. But I do want to get to your article and you write about this and your book, too, which is redistricting and, and, and gerrymandering, which I don't know. I mean, it's less about it's less about race and more about just it, it's about drawing Democrats and Republicans can both do this. I'm not going to make any false equivalencies. You can unwind that. But it's about making sure that when you draw the map of your district, that it's the majority of the people who live there are going to vote for who you want them to vote for. And your new article at The Guardian uh, is titled Republicans can win the next elections through gerrymandering alone. And it made me uh, very sad as I read it while waiting for my daughter's orthodontist to come 
see her. I, I did work in a reference to Hot Vac Summer at the end. I, I did, mean, did see I mean, that. Maybe that helped. I mean, I figured if anybody got to the end of this depressing piece, they deserved a joke. I did see that. I was, let me see if I can find that. Um, no, I think that's right. I mean, I mean, listen, redistricting is how you draw lines that determine oftentimes winners and losers. If you if you draw a district um, and you and you put 90 percent of the Democrats in one area I- into that district, you you not only create a, a packed a district in which a Republican will never win, but you you turn all of the surrounding districts more Republican. So it's a shell game. Right. Um, and Republicans have gotten really, really, really good at it. It's what they do. It's what their power right now in this country and state legislatures around the country is based on. In 2020, Democratic candidates for Congress won 4.7 million more votes than Republican candidates. So that's that's a landslide. And and Democrats only came away with 223 seats, hmm. a five seat majority yeah. off of a 4.7 million vote margin. Now, if you want to compare that to 2014, which is the closest equivalence as far as a, a Republican victory by a similar number of votes, Republicans won in, in 2014 nationally by 4.3 million votes. And they came away with 247 seats. So that's the difference. Uh, That's the power of drawing these lines in such a way that Republicans did in 2010, 2011, um, masterfully. And they have been able to control the country um, and state legislatures ever since, even when they win fewer votes. But the other piece of it that's just so insidious and that we don't talk about often enough is that it requires Democrats to win these huge majorities simply to have a bare majority. So Democrats have to win by millions and millions of votes to simply have this tiny, tiny majority. And when Republicans win by, you know, uh, Republicans can lose by a really good, solid number, and yet still oftentimes even hold on to power. So as you look at 2022, what happens in between 2020 and 2022? Well, it's redistricting. We do it every 10 years. We do it after the census. State legislatures control this process in most of the country. And when you look at the lines that Republicans drew in 2011, in Wisconsin, in North Carolina, in Florida, in Ohio, in Michigan, in Texas, in Georgia, those lines held in Pennsylvania, that those lines held. And it puts Republicans in the catbird seat in just about all of those states Mm. when it comes to redistricting this next time. So they still control the process just about everywhere. They also control the process in states like uh, Tennessee and Kentucky and New Hampshire and Kansas. There is a single Democrat in each of those states. They have already made clear in their public statements that they are going to gerrymander those candidates out. Um, So when you add it up, when you say, well, the two seats in Texas, the two in Georgia, the two in North Carolina, the two in Florida, the single seat in those other states I just mentioned, that's a dozen seats right there that Republicans can win in 2022 simply by redrawing the lines themselves. That's before a single vote has been counted. You could have the exact same vote distribution. Everybody could vote the exact same way. Democrats could win by 4.7 million votes again, and yet you're going to have Speaker Kevin McCarthy. Yeah, uh, maybe want to throw up when you said it just now maybe it made me nauseous earlier but as soon as you landed on kevin mccarthy it made oh so we're talking about the house and we're talking about the redistricting and you've got to read david's piece and he's yeah i mean you got to be one of the go-to people on this because you really seem to have done the the granular work and, and research and journalism on each state and right down to the district to figure out where these these issues are but so my top line question is so if the House, if Republicans take back the House and Kevin McCarthy, who is the the what I describe as like the the bottom of the barrel, the, the, the you know, when when the brain drain leaks and John Boehner goes and then Paul Ryan goes and you're left with Kevin McCarthy, it's, it's like, oh, my God, that's the kid who's who only played in fifth quarter. 
So what is your... Well, we can get worse. Wait till Madison Cawthorn comes in. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, he... Uh, my friend Mo, Mo Davis lost to him. Colonel Moore, Morris Davis. More integrity than probably only any, anybody yeah. that I've ever met, you know? Uh, and he loses to Madison Cawthorn, who is just a, a, a barely human. Sorry. You but, might have Speaker Donald Trump. Uh, I mean, possible, right? right. Po- actually the speaker, possible. The Speaker of the House does not need to be a member of the House. So I was going to say, my question was going to be, what's your biggest concern? And I, and, I, and I would imagine your biggest concern is that they cannot certify the outcome of elections. But it, it is your big, the, the bigger concern would be that someone super crazy becomes the Speaker of the House. And it's very possible that Donald Trump, because the party is a cult now, and, and, and it's no longer a movement of conservatism or republicanism. It's, it's a cult. I think you'd agree. So, so maybe not, but so what is your biggest concern? I mean, um, I think you could have a number of concerns here. Uh, I have concerns about, about state legislatures first gerrymandered state legislatures that begin to rework the way that they award electoral college votes. Um, ah. let's say for example, Wisconsin, decides that it wants to rework the way it awards electoral college votes and wants to do it by district. And I could say, let's say this, but they've already introduced a bill. Um, So they're a step ahead of me. Um, And what they want to do is they say, um, we should award electors based on who wins this congressional district. And the other two electors that represent the Senate Let's give those to the candidate who wins the most congressional districts. So you begin to see where this goes. Joe Biden won the state of Wisconsin. So he took all 10 electoral votes. Mm. Donald Trump won six of the eight congressional districts. So under this plan, Donald Trump would have lost Wisconsin, but taken eight of the 10 electoral votes. What if you begin to see things like that pop up in all of these gerrymandered states that are are swing states that kind of lean blue? If Republicans manage to elect governors, Republican governors in, in Michigan, Wisconsin and Pennsylvania, I predict you're going to see efforts like that in all of those states driven by gerrymandered state legislatures. So that's kind of a nightmare. But then, yeah, exactly what you suggested. You know, um, uh, Democrats wouldn't have even had that five seat advantage in the House in 2020 had they not won two lawsuits about gerrymandered maps, Mm. one in Pennsylvania that turned a 13-5 Republican map into a 9-9 map, and one in North Carolina that turned a 10-3 Republican map into an 8-5. Those are six seats that Democrats would never have won. Right, right. You would have had a one-seat Republican advantage. Hmm. Uh, So, I mean, I throw it out to... You, I mean, I mean, how is January 6th and the counting of the electoral votes different if if Kevin McCarthy is in charge of the House and not Nancy Pelosi? I mean, we saw what a majority of the Republican caucus was willing to do that day. Yeah, there are now different. There's just two sets of rules uh, in terms of how anything plays out. You know, how, 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 you know, when. Mitch McConnell doesn't allow Barack Obama to fill a vacant Supreme Court seat. You're like, oh, all right. So this is they just they're going to have their own set of rules Mm -hmm. that they and and, and those rules are without any kind of integrity in terms of, you know, the outcomes of elections. And you could describe our this whole system that you're talking about being gerrymandered and redistrict. You can talk about the Senate. And I think one easy way to try to understand it and just want to get your take on this is that uh, a minority of Americans are making the most important decisions on our lives that are, I'd say, way out of touch with most people. They're extremely religious, specifically Christian. Now they're super conspiratorial, arguably very racist and sexist and you know, but but if you wanted to just disagree with that, they just hate government. So they don't want to Im- invest in anything in America. I'd say and they hate democracy. They hate democracy. But even if we had a command economy, even if we, you know, like y- you can't compete with China. 
if you want to sit here and argue about government and you hate government, you can't compete with any other country in the world, specifically back to China, and make progress. I mean, we just saw a, 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 a building fall. It just collapsed. And we're talking about infrastructure, and maybe I shouldn't be connecting that, but from infrastructure to the future of our economy, the future of energy, the future of agriculture, all of it. It's like we're going to sit here and argue about transgender bathrooms, and the Chinese are beating a drum and pumping out electric planes. (laughs) No, I think you're right. I mean, I think you've got your finger on two really important things. Do I? I'm just rambling. No, 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 no. The the first is that we are, the crisis that we are in is a crisis of minority rule. Um, And that's what gerrymandering is about. Um, Gerrymandering creates minority rule and state legislatures in the U.S. House. Um, The Electoral College helps entrench minority rule in the White House. And the very structure of the U.S. Senate helps entrench minority rule there, And then the U.S. Senate and the White House together appoint justices to the Supreme Court, which now has five of of nine conservatives uh, who have been appointed by a president who who lost the popular vote. The sixth was uh, Clarence Thomas, appointed by George H.W. Bush. So that's what we're looking at, is this locked-in, entrenched minority rule that is beyond the ability of a majority of voters to change. And then when politicians are then beyond the ability of voters to move the ballot box, you begin to see all of the insane policies that you see out of these state legislatures and out of Congress. Um, it's 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 on climate. It's it's on education. Yeah. It's it's on reproductive rights. It's on voting rights. It's on labor rights. It's all the way across the board. Yeah, I mean, talk about education. This whole critical race theory conversation. That's like, you know, they they don't want history to be even taught. They want. Or they want a history like, now listen, Jesus was born in America. <laughs> and he and, and his wife made the American flag. Like just like a, a kind of history that is this, a, a kind of patriotic pornography or jingoism that, that, that is, uh, would almost be obscene. Th- they want to teach a whole different thing. So, all right, I'll let you go. But I want to, you know, look, you know, you're, you're involved with a lot of movements and, and, and fair vote, right? And you, you, you know what? what we need to do. And I wonder if I kind of am an, a democratic party apologist. I think it's fair to say, like, I don't want to just sit here and complain if I don't know what the solution. And I don't know what the solution is to get Joe Manchin and Kirsten Cinema's vote. I don't, cause we're not talking about the house when we criticize Democrats, if we want, they're passing legislation out of the house, very progressive uh, uh, legislation. I, I would say, it's the Senate, and it almost seems to be two people. I think you can get everybody else on board to just toss the filibuster out at this point because they really realize the stakes, but I don't know. So is it just the Senate? Is these two people, and is it just these two people? Is there anything? Where is the leverage? Where is the carrot or stick? It's the filibuster or democracy. I mean, it's, it's, it's really that simple yeah. at this point. Um, it's, it's the filibuster, and it's, 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 it's racist uh, white suppression history. Or it's American representative democracy, and you can't have both. Democrats have got to understand that this is an urgent moment, and that if they don't act in this rare opportunity of having the White House in both branches of Congress, that they may not have either of those branches of Congress after November 22, and they might not get them back for a long, long time to come. And all you've got to do is look around at the state legislatures. All you've got to do is look at the response to January 6th, and you understand the nature of the enemy that you are fighting against. Uh, So if they don't move with this fierce urgency of now, you know, as people Uh, talked about back in the 1960s. I don't know when they get another chance to do it again. So I don't know how you move uh, Joe Manchin and Kirsten Sinema. I mean, if none of these arguments resonates with them, we're in a a deep 
a deep flaming pile of trouble because this is the last best opportunity we're going to have to make change and reform perhaps for a decade. Yeah. And uh, I don't think it's hyperbolic to wonder what American democracy looks like on the other side of uh, another decade of entrenched Republican rule in state legislatures and and in the U.S. House. I, I don't think it's 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 anything any of us ever thought we would see in our lifetimes or would want to see in our lifetimes. So I hope that Joe Biden has some sticks and some carrots that he can use to bring these guys along. You know, I'm. Uh, West Virginia has some needs, right? I mean, Arizona must. Uh, and if they don't have needs, you know, uh, uh, perhaps there's an Air Force base that needs to move out of Arizona, you know, and into, you know, and into another state. I mean, uh, that's interesting. Sticks, yeah, right? I haven't I mean, I, I heard something like that. That's interesting. And I, I'm, I'm sure Johnson understood that. Yeah, that's it. That's fascinating. But Joe Biden doesn't seem like that kind of operator, but but he may, may, maybe he will be convinced to be. But that's mm-hmm. an interesting point about about you know maybe taking get, taking jobs out that that will affect them but but it's it's tough i mean it's tough it's there aren't really a lot of incentives for you know i i kind of hope that there's this game that that joe manchin's playing where it's just i'm gonna let them try everything they can and if republicans are gonna vote against everything i'll eventually have kind of the the the, the political capital to say listen they won't vote for anything, and I, I've got to vote for this. And, you know, after, after we tried everything, especially, you know, the January 6th commission, you would have thought that would have been his pivot point. But, you know, of course, I hope that's the case. But I also thought that Joe Biden had a, a front row seat for watching Mitch McConnell and the and the senators over the course of Barack Obama's presidency. And I thought maybe he would come into office having learned something rather than spending his his first five months repeating all of the all of the same fruitless attempts. Yeah, but I, I completely agree with you, except to, again, be the Democratic apologist. Like, this is the game that he has to play for Joe Manchin to be able to have an argument to finally do what he needed to do as a, the long, because people, a lot of people, you know, it's a, it's a, a the argument resonates with me, David, uh, of he's the only person who could get elected as a Democrat in West Virginia. Like, I've heard from West Virginia folks that that's pretty, pretty close to true. Probably is. So we got to deal with them. We've got to deal with them, um, you know, and, and these are the nights that you curse Cal Cunningham's name in North Carolina. Oh, God, yes. These yeah, are yeah. The nights where you wonder why Sarah Gideon ended up with millions of dollars <laughs> left over in her race against Susan Collins. Yep, these yep. are the days where you wonder why Steve Bullock didn't run a better race in Montana. They're the days where you think about Charles Schumer and his leadership at the DSCC and the kinds of candidates that he recruited. You know, I, mean, I would have rather run Charles Booker against Mitch McConnell than Amy McGrath. Yeah, that uh, would have been better. You know, how do you come up with candidates and how do you think about positioning yourself as a Democratic Party in the U.S. Senate? Uh, they had winnable races that they were not able to win. And here we go, heading towards 2022. They're going to have to win in Pennsylvania. They've got to win in Wisconsin. They have to try to hold the seat in Georgia. Uh, you're going to have an open seat in North Carolina. You've got an open seat in Missouri. What kind of candidates are you going to go with? And what lessons have the Democratic Party learned about their failures um, to take these key seats last time around that handed Manchin and Cinema the possibility of acting like, you know, prime minister. Such great points, such great analysis. So great to talk to you about all of it. You've had uh, such an impressive career and, and, and know so much about all of this. It's so great to just be in conversation with you and get to ask you these questions. All the links for David's work, of course, in the show notes, and I'll tell them all about that after I say goodbye to you. Thank you very much for joining me. I love Always talking to you. Indeed. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Okay, there he goes, David Daly. David Daly 3, read his bees at The Guardian, get his books, tell him you heard him on the show. Awesome. Really enjoyed that conversation. Hopefully you did as well. Special thanks, as always, to Dr. Aaron Carroll for joining us. Read his piece at The New York Times. And another shout-out to John Carroll, no relation, who will be dropping this song available for everybody tomorrow, July 1st. So go get Stand Up. July 26th, I'll be in Boston with Jay Alcovan. Get your tickets now. Tickets still available. There's going to be several listeners there already. I think John Carroll said he's going. 
So that's very cool. That's in Boston, July 26th. Link for tickets in the show notes for that as well. Thank you very much for listening, everybody. Put a lot into this each and every day, so it means so, so much to me. Thank you so much for your feedback, for your kind words, and, of course, for your support and subscriptions. Go to patreon.com slash Pete Dominic right now if you haven't already. And I'll talk to you tomorrow because every day, if it's a weekday, it's time to stand up. Bye-bye. Did I really just say that? That could be catchy. In every way you know how Don't be told up You got to show up Ain't no better time to do it but now No need to pledge allegiance To no wanton tribe Rise up, show obedience To the voice inside And listen well and it'll tell you Not to run and hide